Not a sin, but a shame. Not a sin, but a shame. Over in the book of Job, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 10, we read that there are some things that nature itself teaches us. And in the New Testament, I'm going to give you some scripture too here that lets us know that there are some things in life that nature itself teaches us. And if we go against the pattern of nature, of the things that it teaches us, we don't necessarily sin, but we do bring upon ourselves a stigmatizing shame that is very cruel to us in this life. Verse 7 in the book of Job, beginning the 12th chapter, verse 7. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Verse 8, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Verse 9, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Knowing of a certainty that such a discourse like this, what I'm getting ready to enter into, will invite scorn and contempt from those who are out of the way and who are misinformed and mistaught, I still, with God's help, I will still endeavor to address an issue that has and still does today trouble many Christians uh, throughout the land, especially those who have family members who have stigmatized themselves among all those they come into contact with as they have fallen prey to their own unwise enslavement of chaining choices. You know, you've probably heard it said, and wisely so, that uh, with every choice you make and proceed to engage yourself to, there is a consequence and sometimes an awful aftermath to reap from such. The choices some have made in this life have been choices of cruelty against themselves and against their children as they went against the pattern of nature around us. The scripture I'll begin with tells us that there are some things that we can learn from the earth around us. And even from the fish of the sea, in other words, there are lessons of wisdom that even the animal world teaches us if we would just observe how God has ordered their ranks. Now, there are some choices in life that people uh, make that are not sin, but they are a shame. Let me give you a uh, for instance over in 1 Corinthians, which is in the New Testament, chapter 11, verse 14. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul said, Thus doth not even nature itself teach you, that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Notice, Paul the Apostle acknowledges here that nature teaches us some things. It teaches us uh, that there are some things that are not a sin. But nevertheless, it's a sickening, sorrowful shame unto those that make choices contrary to the patterns of nature about us. God uses even the fish of the sea and planet earth, elements of nature, to impart unto us wisdom. Now Jesus did not have long hippie hair, uh, like all these artistic paintings portray him. And how do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul would never call that a shame if our Lord himself had long hair. And the scripture also tells us in 1 John 2.6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So if Jesus had long hair, then all Christian men should have it too, walking as he walked, living as he lived. The scripture tells us that such is a shame for a man, not a sin, but a shame. Now I can know that Christ did not have long hair when in the flesh here on earth. Now let's move on to another issue that nature teaches us of which if we go against the pattern of such we have not sinned but we will bring a stigmatizing shame against ourselves that would make some of you wish that you were never even born into this life and especially your children and that is the issue of interracial marriage now how does the pattern of nature teach you against such remember the scripture about the fish of the sea and the whole of seawater life, it is everything after its own color and kind. White trout with white trout, red trout with red trout, speckled trout with speckled trout, gray sharks with gray sharks, 
white sharks with white sharks, rainbow trout with rainbow trout, brown trout with brown trout, black flounder with black flounder. Let's look at the bird world. Red birds with red birds, blue jays with blue jays, black crows with black crows. Everything after its own color and kind, but when mankind crossbreeds animals, even those very animals suffer a stigma and are called mutts and hinds 57 and common pigeons and half-breeds and are worthless in dollars and cents. So even the animal world suffers a stigma if you crossbreed the color and the kind. Now, when white women marry black men and white men marry black women, they have not sinned. But they have went against the pattern of nature uh, about us. And they, will, and they have, by doing so, they brought a stigmatizing shame against themselves. And their children, children really have to suffer the cruel shame of it all. In the Old Testament, we see how God kept an ongoing catechism continually before the Israelites, warning them by such that to never mix with people of other nations. Solomon disobeyed God on this issue and took wives of other nations that turned his heart away from God to their heathen idols. God told Israel not to even wear a garment of wool or silk or any material blended with a different material. God told Israel not to even plant two different types of vegetables in the same row. These were a catechism of ordinances to ever remind them, don't mix yourselves with others around you. As Christians, we should never treat anyone ill or mean or inferior because of their color. But if we interracially marry, we have gone against the lesson of nature about us that teaches us better and will incur a stigmatizing shame to ourselves as a result of such. Now, in closing this out, I know some's going to probably throw this back at me, and they're going to say, well, what about Moses in the Old Testament? It's believed that he married a Gentile woman of a dark race, and when his brother Aaron came against him and his sister Miriam came against him about the issue, God took Moses aside, and Miriam was struck with leprosy. And God forgave him and healed Miriam of the leprosy. But the reason why Moses uh, took unto him a, uh, we don't know for sure if she was dark-skinned, Ethiopian, but uh, let's just presume that the theologians are right with their presumption there. But the reason why he took a Gentile broad was because God was establishing types and shadows. Now only Christians and theology students will understand that type of terminology. Just like only mathematical students will understand uh, certain type of uh, language. They call it the language of Mathis, mathematical language. Uh, to understand functions and limits and continuities and stuff in the field of math. Well, uh, Christians understand types and shadows when I say that. So I don't understand all of I don't expect all of you to understand that. But God was established in types and shadows. Moses went to his own and his own received him not. Therefore he went out into the desert. He repented. He waited upon God. And uh, he married a Gentile bride. And that was the same way with Christ. He came into his own. His own received him not. Then he took unto him a Gentile bride. God allowed him to do that. It was He was establishing types and shadows. But God, through Moses himself, instructed all the other people, don't do that. Don't go to other people of another nation. Don't mix yourself with other people of other cultures. And so, you know, it's not a sin. Now, if I'm not saying, and don't call me a racist because I'm not. I, I play music at black churches. I love black people. They love me. I love people of all races. Uh, but I have noticed through the years how the children really suffer. And because we're living in a cruel world where most of the majority of mankind are sinful, God-hating people, uh, they like to be cruel to one another. And when they see you, a white woman with a black man, the message they get is that you're telling white men that black men are better than uh, white men. If it were not so, you'd have you a white man. 
And the reason why black men hate to see a black woman with a white man is because they get the message from the black woman that she's saying white men are better than black men. If it were not so, I'd have me a black man. That doesn't mean they're trying to give that message to people, but that's the way a sinful world interprets those interracial relationships at times. And because of that and issues beyond that, people bring a stigmatizing shame unto themselves. They have not sinned, but they have brought a stigma upon themselves. When you go out into nature, you see red birds with red birds, blue jays with blue jays, black crows with black crows. It'd be a freak of nature if you went outside and saw a red bird and a black crow in the same nest together. Some people would want to shoot them because it would just be too freakish. Uh, but uh, And that's how some people look on this interracial thing. Some people believe that Larry Flint was shot and paralyzed. He's been paralyzed most of his life now over that very issue because in one of his pornography magazines, I, maybe, God forgive me, I shouldn't even bring that type of thing into this message, but it does prove a point anyway uh, to show you how uh, some people just get incited over it. It looks so freakish to them. Uh, but after he had ran an article with a white woman and a black man in one of his magazines, hey, he was shot and he's paralyzed from the waist down. I've noticed people in the grocery stores and at Walmart, uh, when a black man's with a white woman, it looks like he's on edge. It looks like he's very nervous at all times because he knows how people react to that. And he knows how there are some white skinheads out there, if that's what they call, or white racists that... And some of these guys would like to chain him and drag him behind a car. Is that right? No. Oh, as Now, especially, a Christian should love everybody. We shouldn't prejudice against ourselves against any color. We should love black people as well as white people. And black Christians should love us as well as we love them. But uh, And it's not a sin if you interracially marry. But it is a shame because it is against the pattern of nature. Uh, when we follow the pattern of nature, uh, we're not going to incur a stigma unto ourselves. But oh my, if you don't believe what I say, just go to interracial couples that have crossed that line and went against the pattern of nature and ask them how they have suffered and especially their children. Especially when a white woman sends her daughter or her white son that she had from a previous marriage to school and has a black man drop them off. Do you know how cruel the white kids are to that those white kids out on the campus? They surround those kids and they say, your daddy is a, and they use the N-word. Uh, and, and, and can you imagine how cruel the black kids are to a black boy or a little black girl who has a white man drop them off? They get them out on the campus and say, your dad's a white honky cracker or something like that. Now, I hate that type of language. I hate it, and I'm against it, and I don't think that it, I don't think children should have to go through that. And it's not that you want your children to go through that if you have interracially married. But face it, we are in a cruel world, and a lot of you listening to this message, you know that your children have come home with these same horror stories, how they have been physically attacked at the school, and they've had to endure some sickening, sorrowful shame because you went and interracially married, and you unwisely had that person of another race drop your kids off at school. Uh, a lot of these people who interracially marry, because they know they're going to be stigmatized, they do try to keep it a secret. Uh, but anyway, uh, please don't email me and accuse me of being a racist or anything like that, because I'm not. But uh, very few people touch on this uh, subject, and there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be so glad they're going to send me emails, and they're going to say thank you so much for touching on this issue. Because you're right, even the animal world, they even suffer a stigma. You crossbreed animals, you can't get no money for them. And they're even demeaned verbally by being called mutts. Pigeons, I used to raise them. I used to raise fantail, king pigeons, homing pigeons. But the regular pigeons that just fly around the street, they're just called common pigeons because they just interbreed any kind of way. And I took note of that and I thought, oh my, even the pigeons, you know, they're called old common pigeons. And... Uh, you know, horses, if you keep Clodsdale with Clodsdale, Palominos with Palominos, uh, if you keep all the, the breeds together, Tennessee Walker with Tennessee Walker, you can get something for it. But when you crossbreed them, you might get $100 for a horse or so, if that sometimes.
So anyway, it works that way with people, folks. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it should be that way. But just as the Apostle Paul said, nature itself teaches us it's a shame, not a sin, but a shame if a man have long hair. Nature teaches us other things, as in the book of Job, I started off this message with that scripture. Uh, if you'd learn wisdom, you know, go to the fishes of the sea, go to the birds of the air, uh, and, and look and see and behold how God has set the ranks of order in them. And when we follow the order and pattern of nature that God has even established with the creatures of the earth, uh, chances are if we go with that order, we're not going to suffer a stigma. We're not going to suffer a shame. But when we go against it, uh, there's no getting around it because we're living amongst fallen sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And because most of mankind is lost, is headed to hell, many are called but few are chosen, uh, Jesus said, let the wheats and tares grow together, the goats and the sheep grow together. In the end, there's going to be a great harvest. He's going to separate the goats from the sheep. But as long as there's the goats down here and there's the tares amongst the wheat, those people of that order, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, not the chosen uh, elect, because God's children aren't going to treat anybody cruel because they have crossed that line and even went against the pattern of nature. They're not going to treat anybody cruel that they feel sorry for. Uh, and since by God's grace we're to love everybody, uh, God lets us pity those that we see have went unwisely against the pattern of nature. We don't condemn them. We don't throw stones at them. But uh, we know that they're going to suffer stigmatizing shame. If anybody comes to me, if you're white and you want to marry black, or black you want to marry white, uh, or whatever, and uh, you ask me, is it okay to do it? I would tell you it's not a sin, but uh, just like it's not a sin for a man to have long hair, it's a shame. I think that you would be bringing a shameful stigma against yourself and your children, not because you're sinning by joining in this union, but because you're going against the pattern of nature that even people who are don't know nothing about the scripture. They just see that as a freakish, out-of-the-way thing. And they're the ones that's going to, per not true Christians, but they're the ones, the people of the world, they're the ones that's going to make it hard for you. Many a white woman has lost their job when they've seen a black man drop them off. Many a black woman has lost her job probably. They see a white uh, man drop her off. Uh, I heard there was a TV program just days ago where on TV, they were talking about this, and even one of the black guys said, man, I hate to see a black woman wear a white guy. Oh, I hate that. That really bothers me. Well, it bothers a lot of white men to see a white woman with a black guy. And not they necessarily hate white people, and the black people hate the white. But, and it, not that the white woman or the white man's trying to portray this message, but the message that the black man gets and feels intimidated when he sees a black woman with a white man he feels like that black woman, once again, is saying white men are better than black men. If it were not so, I'd have me a black man. In the same way, when a white man sees a black, well, a white woman with a black man, he feels like the white woman is saying black men are better than white men. If it were not so, I'd have me one. Uh, I've seen in the job sector, even where I work, I've seen a white woman night after night hanging around a black guy that I uh, worked with from time to time, or no, he was in the, I didn't work with him, he was in another section, but I used to talk to him, and he used to be a baseball star, and uh, and this was a nice looking white woman, well, uh, even the people in the office, I think it was just appropriate and sickening to them, they ended up getting rid of her, they laid off people they didn't want to lay off just to get down her rank, to get her off the floor. I mean, that's how uh, these people even suffer in job sector. Is that right? Is that right treatment? Well, absolutely not. But I'm just telling you how it is. And if those of you who are honest with yourself, uh, you know that I'm just speaking the truth. Now, a lot of you, you know, you know this is truth. You wish I wouldn't speak it because a lot of you just don't want to hear this. You, uh, some people just don't want to hear the truth. But don't uh, email me and put some off the wall comment in the video. Say, oh, he's a racist. And he says that. No, you don't even know what you're talking about if you say that. By the grace of God, only I've had black Christian brethren. I've been to their churches and played. They hug and kiss me. And, and just, I love them to death. They love me. And I'm not no racist. And I love black folks. And uh, 
Uh, I, I love them as much as white folks. I love the Mexicans. I, I was in a welding situation days ago, and I made some friends with some Mexicans, and they really took to me real quickly. They, they could tell when you got the love of God in you and you're not prejudiced. And, uh, and so uh, folks know. So anyway, don't be sending me no messages saying I'm racist. I'm just giving you a segment of Scripture out of the Word of God that lets you know that there are the patterns of nature. God tells us to even go to nature, look at it, and even the Apostle Paul lets us know there's some things that's not a sin, but it is a shame. And even Moses suffered a stigma because even his own brother and sister took up uh, a reproach against him because of his interracial marriage. Yes, God took Moses as son, but God only allowed that to establish a type and shadow of Christ coming to his own. His own received him not. Moses went to his own. And they said, will you kill us like you kill the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses freaked out and said, they're going to turn me into the Egyptians. I'm here to help them. They don't have sense enough to know it. He runs out to the desert. He marries a Gentile bride. Well, Christ came to his own. His own received him not. And so he's been taken unto himself a Gentile bride. Uh, uh, the Bible lets us know that... Uh, uh, it, it lets us know that uh, we're in a dispensation of time uh, where God is turning to the Gentiles. The church is made up of a group of Gentiles and Jews. Uh, it's only a remnant according to the election of grace. And when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then you're going to see God turn back to Israel in a way as we have not seen just yet in its fullness in this life up to this point. So anyway, I thank you all for looking at this message, and I'm sure there'll be some of you who have friends that have gotten interracially married, and if you want them to have a better understanding and even know a little bit about what the Scripture says about it, and not to intimidate them or to insult them, but uh, just to give them a better insight into why they are suffering uh, the way they do. We, When we make choices in life, we have to pay a price for the choices we make. To every choice you make, there is a consequence. May God bless you with grace to always make the right choices. God bless you.